Thank you very much, and sorry for the late start. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to interview Vicki Croak. She is an adventurer, an intellect, a humanitarian. Reading her book, you are transported to another world, a world that you haven't really imagined if you live in a metropolitan area, or even if you live in a suburban area. You're transported to a magical, magical world. Elephant Company is an amazing book about elephants in Burma. And it seems like a very um, esoteric subject, something that would be very specialized, and yet she has managed to make it universal. You come away a better person for having read this book. And so it is my very, very great pleasure to be talking to Vicki Croak. Let me give you a little background on Vicki. She um, is based in Boston. She has chronicled animal life for two decades. She covers animal affairs for WBUR-FM, Boston's NPR station, and also online. And she has won the 2003 Edward R. Murrow Award. She has participated in nature documentaries with Nature and Disney. And she has written for 13 years the Boston Globe's column, Animal Beat. So she is well qualified to take on the topic of, an of elephants in Burma. Now, Elephant Company, just to give you a little background, is a part biography, and it's a part war epic, because it does involve World War II, and then it's a wildlife adventure. So it's a really, um, it transcends genders. Women and men would love this book. I know I personally adored it, but I know my father and my brother would love it too. And the descriptions of Burma are so vivid that you actually look up from the page and you're surprised that you're not in the jungle. It's incredible. I was reading it in a Manhattan apartment and I was absolutely transported to another world. You hear the trumpets of the elephants as you're reading it, it's amazing. The poignancy of the relationship between man and beast is amazing. Um, and I really want Vicki to tell us, I can't sit here and tell us, oh, I'm losing all my pages. Um, so my first question, Vicki, that's not a question, that, that's just nonsense. Okay, so my first question to you is, um, we always, as writers, we always understand the basic premise of any fiction or nonfiction is character is story. And you really have two characters. You have your protagonist, the man who works with the elephants, and you have an elephant, which is also a very strong character in the book. Tell us a little bit about character as story. And why don't you start with your protagonist? Uh, the, or just talking, talk, 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 he said. All right. Uh, well, that's what I'm here for anyway. Um, the, the hero of the story is a man named J.H. Williams. He was an elephant whisperer before we ever had that terminology. He was an animal lover who had gone through World War I, and like so many young men who came out the other end of World War I, he was damaged in some way. It wasn't physical for him, and he never wanted to talk about what he went through. But when he came back home, he thought the cure for him would be to lose himself in the forest with animals. And right at that time, because so many young men from England had died, uh, the teak logging companies in Burma were owned by, by British firms. They were all British firms. And so many of the men who had worked for them died during the war. So they were on a, um, they were on a hiring spree. And uh, one of his mates, from the army told him that logging companies were hiring guys in Burma to go work with elephants, and that did it for him. He came there knowing nothing about them, but by the time he left 25 years later, he would know 1,000 elephants by name. And he would have become kind of a de facto elephant uh, veterinarian because they had no vets at that time. And, uh, but, the, but to the point that you were asking about, which is character, I feel like it's a badge of honor that when I finished the first draft of Elephant Company, my editor said it was great that the elephants were all very full-bodied characters, but they wanted me to get the human beings up to the level uh, <laughs> that the elephants had been. So I thought, I've done, I've done my job. So the second big character in this is Bandula, and Bandula is an elephant who's re a remarkable male. He's huge, he's beautiful, he has pink freckling across his cheeks, and his tusks set, they, in Burmese they would say, they went up and out, angled like the arms of a Burmese dancing girl. 
And Bandula was trained in a way that none of the elephants got to be trained. And that is from the time he was five years old, he was trained with his mother. And he was sort of a mini-me. He picked up all of the commands from her. So when they were told, mit, sit, he would sit with his mother. And ta, stand, he would stand up. And what happened from that is he was very comfortable with human beings. The other elephants, for, the large, for almost all the other elephants, were uh, broken in, a, in something um, called kadaring. So young elephants would be driven into a stockade, food and water would be withheld from them, they'd be left out in the sun, and they would be beaten yeah. until, as uh, William said, they were heartbroken. And Bandula didn't have that life. He was raised with his mother and with people who loved him, and they trained him gently, a sort of gentling process, so that he was smarter and more reliable than the other elephants. But the great thing about Bandula, what was important to J.H. Williams, is that he swore Bandula had a sense of humor. And Bandula's great joke always was the elephants were used to, to bring logs that were cut down, teak logs, to creeks and rivers. When the monsoon came, the rivers would wash away the logs. So Bandula would, uh, he was a big, big bull, and he was given the largest logs to drag or push or pull. He'd bring them right to a creek or a river edge, and then he would pretend I'm glad to have a dog in the audience. <laughs> it never hurts. <laughs> he would pretend that he couldn't push the log at all, and he would pantomime that he was shoving his shoulder into it and pushing and pushing, and the guys knew that he was just fooling around. They'd say, Bandula, please just throw the log in the river. And Bandula, when he got tired of his own joke, he would flick it with his trunk as though it was a toothpick, and then everyone swore Bandula would laugh. He is, he is such an endearing elephant that you, you know, I never was particularly interested in elephants, and after reading your book, I'm obsessed with them. I mean, your knowledge of elephant anatomy is astounding. I mean, it's a very scientifically based book in that you've really done the research on how these animals think, how they function. Um, you know, I learned things like, um, African elephants are more active and Asian elephants are more serene and I learned that the that the elephant's sense of smell is five times more acute than a bloodhound and just all these really cool facts. How, um, how do you go about learning all of your science? Because this is not just a light read. I mean, you really do learn. I feel like I know everything about elephants from reading your book. <laughs> and it's really fascinating. And I'm so glad I do, because I really didn't understand how utterly fabulous they are as animals. How do you go about doing this sort of investigation into their you know, personalities? I think the, uh, the larger view of elephants in general, I've been covering animal issues for 25 years. I knew a lot about elephants. One of my favorite factoids is what happens to male elephants, usually once a year, though the timing um, can change, is a period called must, in which their hormones, their testosterone levels rise 50 to 100 times normal it can. Uh, and I would say, can you imagine if that happened to all the men in this tent <laughs> right at this moment? I think it's a fascinating thing that happens to elephants. It changes their their worldview. But, but the most important thing that happened is I had done a lot of research uh, with reading uh, and certainly interviewing some of the leading elephant experts of our time. I was very lucky to have access to them, including Katie Payne, the woman who found that elephants use infrasound. That's um, a frequency lower than our hearing, and they can communicate with one another. They have a secret language, they right? They do. Which I was fascinated. Tell us a little bit about that. That's really interesting. So Katie Payne worked with her husband, Roger Payne. They'd done a lot of work with whales, and we all know about whale song. And people who had studied elephants for a long time had a, would often have a joke about elephant ESP. They'd be up in a plane, a researcher, and they may see, you know, they had a great vista they could see below them. They could see groups of elephants far away from one another suddenly turn toward one another as though they had an appointment with each other. And they used to call that elephant ESP, as though they were making a date by telephone with each other. And Katie knew all of that information, and she had worked with whales. She was standing in a, an American zoo, and she felt a sensation in her chest that reminded her of the organ at church when it hit the lowest, lowest notes. And she thought something was going on with them, and other people had thought some of that too, but she was the first person to bring equipment, record them, and see how much, it's th I think, three times more often they communicate through this infrasound, which we for the most part don't hear. There's a little bit above level, but we could feel in our chest. So in many ways it's a secret language that we don't even we don't even know they're talking except you can see their their heads flutter a little bit when they're doing that. But a big part of our research and Kristen Gogan and I went every other week to meet with two elephants in the zoo in um, New Bedford, the um, 
Oh God, the Buttonwood Park Zoo, which used to be a horrible, horrible zoo, by the way. Um, but they've gotten their, their, their act together. But there are two elephants, Emily and Ruthie. We were allowed in with them, which at this point in time, the zoo association has mostly stopped people, even the keepers, from going with elephants. So it was a very, very lucky thing that every other week, Kristen and I went in with Emily and Ruth, and they taught me elephant in a way that no one else could. You know, lest we um, paint this as a sort of version of National Geographic, this book has a very strong story narrative also. And um, in addition to the facts about elephants, there's a very poignant story about their role in the teak logging industry. There's a, a poignant story about World War II, and I don't want to give away the plot, but it is, um, it is a whole, again, let's go back to character. When a writer has a character, that character has to transition. They have to have realizations. They have to change. They have to encounter um, adversity and come to new realizations from that. And you not only have your protagonist do that, he comes as a very green young guy to Burma, as British colonial, and then has this huge transformation of character and, and realization of you know, the, the importance of animals and in, our, in our lives. Um, you have a war, and you have an elephant who transitions. I mean, I don't even know how, as a writer, I don't know how you make the um, elephant have a transition, a, a personality transition <laughs> for an animal, but it's really quite astonishing the way you do that. What, how do you dovetail those two narratives um, together it's, it, to make, uh, to really make a story? Because character is story, but you still have to write the story, too. Billy, you're so kind, Kitty, thank you. Um, Billy Williams, Elephant Bill, his life was so intertwined with the elephants, and in many ways I think that those of us who grow up and you go to work and you, you mature as a human being in your workplace, and his workplace and his colleagues happen to be elephants, and he always said, I learned more about courage from the elephants than from any other human being, and he learned more about trust and humor and integrity from those elephants, and they really, affected the way he lived his life as a man. Uh, when I have a little PowerPoint talk, I show that he always thought the elephants were kind of romantic and gentle in their pursuit of the females, and so I show a picture of his wife, and she always said that the way uh, Elephant Bill pursued her was informed by the bull elephants <laughs> and the way that they were, were kind in that. But he saw how courageous they were, that they put their life at risk for one another, and, he, and their intelligence was important to him. From one of the first things that he discovered is these elephants who worked in the logging camps of Burma, and they still do to this day, now Myanmar, uh, they, are, they work four to six hours a day, and then they're released into the forest at night. And their elephant handlers, or uh, there they're called Uzis or Mahouts, look for their footprints in the morning to bring them back to work. They know their own elephant's footprints. And then they listen for the teak bell that each handler has fashioned for his own elephant. So he can tell the difference in sound from the tolling of the bell. And when one of the first things that Williams observed about them, and by the way, all of his observations were only validated many, many decades later by our modern field biologists, but all of the things that he observed were true and were very insightful. So one of the things that the elephants did, they'd be caught in the morning, their mahouts would hear their bells that come and get them, but if they really got into something good, like a banana plantation, and they didn't want to be found out, they would stuff mud up into their... Up so into the elephant would stuff his own bell with mud. Yes. They're much smarter than they are. <laughs> That's amazing. And he saw them behaving like that. So they, he felt that he was the person he was and when he went on to the war. I mean, he would be, he was one of the most courageous guys fighting behind enemy lines. He worked for the British Dirty Tricks Department. That's the, but he was under uh, Elite Force 136. And he was awarded the um, Order of the British Empire for his bravery. We've, you know, uh, wildlife, African wildlife has been in the news lately with Cecil the lion and it's gone viral and everyone's been, you know, just outraged at, you know, how backward some people are about animals. Um, your protagonist was, uh, Williams was absolutely enlightened mm -hmm. when it came to um, the kind treatment of animals. Talk to us a little bit about how his thinking has now, spin it forward a little bit, how has his thinking really still with us today in terms of how elephants are treated? And then I'll open it up for your questions because I'm sure you do have some. Fantastic. So when Williams came to Burma in 1920, there wasn't a notion of animal rights. When he saw how abused some of the elephants were, particularly in being captured, he wanted to change it, but he knew he couldn't, especially as, as you said, this green novice isn't going to go to his bosses and say, you know, we're being really mean to the elephants. 
and I don't like it and we need to change that. The only way he could persuade the people who own the tea, his tea company uh, was that it would make economic sense to be nicer to them. And he proved on paper that instead of uh, keeping the mothers working after, they had their, after the babies were born, in which case they couldn't touch them, they couldn't nurse them as often as they would in the wild, they couldn't teach them in the way that they normally would, uh, that if the company allowed, it would be cheaper for them if they allowed the babies to be raised alongside their mothers, if they gave the mothers a little bit of, of time off. These are all things that he felt intuitively in his gentleness. And in meeting, he met the one mahout in Burma, who was a master mahout and had really come up with the no notion of gentling rather than breaking an elephant. And that's what drew, what drew me to the story is this guy innately, I often wonder what my own sensibility would be if I had grown up in a different time. And I'm always amazed by someone who is innately kind and his kindness was both to humans and to animals. And I think they're tied, I know they're tied together and all of our science is showing that to us now. But the things that he was insightful about that he didn't have to read about um, really intrigued me and, the st and he, as he said, knowing an elephant is nine-tenths love. Sure is. Um, I'm sure you have questions. Anyone like to ask a question? Sir? Yes. I, I love the idea of the elephant returning to me, but I wanted to ask you, they let the elephants go into the woods or into the forest with their little bells, and evidently then the elephants would choose not to take off. Right. Did the, the, so the question is, how is it that elephants who were released into the forest would choose not to just take off? What's interesting is uh, they had there was so much food, they were basically living in a salad bowl, and among other elephants, and with wild elephants, they often mated with, with wild elephants, that their life, the life of a normal wild elephant was all around them for those many hours a day, and they didn't feel a need to run. Um, what's interesting, one of the big things that got broken for these captive elephants and is still today is that they never could form the kind of elephant, natural elephant groupings that we see in our wildlife documentaries where a female matriarch and maybe her sisters and her daughters and their children all stay together and that wise matriarch uh, leads them. They couldn't do that. They were broken apart. They'd, one elephant would be sent to one camp and another to another. But elephants are so resilient in their emotion uh, that they formed, nonetheless they formed these bonds. The female were, uh, had twice sins. They were other females who helped them raise their babies. And as William And attested, aunties, right? There, aunties, there were two right, aunties, right. right. I love the story of how there are two anti elephants that sort of and bonded. They, they, and they take care of those babies. Uh, Katie Payne, one of her great stories is that in captivity in a zoo, there were two of these uh, sister elephants, and one had a baby, and the other one was actually was really jealous, and she wanted more baby time. She stole milk from the mother's teats and painted her own teats with some milk to get the baby to come over and suckle from her. I mean, there's elephants are just one. Talk about story. sibling rivalry. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the best sibling rivalry story is from also from uh, Katie Payne that she once observed in the morning two sister elephants walking side by side. The tusk of one was broken off and embedded in the side of her sister. And I would say, if you have a sister, you know what happened. But by morning, they had forgiven each other. But in, but in these camps, uh, what, what uh, Williams always saw was uh, if other groups of elephants came in and they worked together at night when they were, they would see each other. We know this from films today. There would be an elephant reunion. Those who were related to each other or had worked together before recognized each other. And somehow through their secret language, they seemed to make a date to meet up later. And when they were let out in the afternoon to go into the forest, they would come right together and spend the evening together. Yes? <laughs> so how did I get all the information about J.H. Williams? The book I wrote before uh, was a very different path. In this case, there wasn't as much written. I wrote about the woman who brought the first giant panda back to the States in 1936, and she, her journey was covered extensively in the, in the press. For Williams, that kind of coverage didn't come until the war, and that's when he became a celebrity. But before that, he's a guy alone in the Burmese forest for 25 years recording all of this information. So if he didn't write it himself, no one else was doing it. And I was very, very lucky to find his son, Tree Williams, who's a racehorse veterinarian in Tasmania, and he had trunks of his father's material. Um, I flew to Tasmania. I didn't have a good sense beforehand about how much information he had. Sometimes I talked to him and it sounded like there was a lot. Sometimes we'd speak by phone and it sounded like maybe there wasn't a lot. And I found out why that went back and forth. I came to Tasmania. We met. He showed me that the, he had this little case. It was like a little overnight bag with archival information. And I thought, well, if that's what it is, that's what it is. I'm happy to have it. 
we had dinner that night and many, many single malt scotches. And the next morning when I turned to Treve's house, there was a huge trunk now set out for me. And he hadn't, he hadn't looked through himself his entire life. He didn't even know what was in there. It was just full of a treasure trove of correspondence, articles that uh, Williams had never um, seen published, screenplays that he had written that revealed much more of his own emotion, and that, that was a really wonderful find. Thank you. I'm, I'm just curious, because I'm from New Bedford, and I'm familiar with the transition of the zoo. What did you do with Ruth and Emily? I mean, and how did you find them? Do you think that they're happy there? Mm -hmm. Or do you think they're mistreated in some way? It's been very controversial in my town about it is. what's really going on. So my time, uh, our time with uh, Ruth and Emily uh, at the Buttonwood Park Zoo. I, what did I do there with them? We did everything from, I'm happy to say, I cleaned up their poop one day. I mean, I, um, I wanted to participate in all of it. I have, it's a very complicated question to say, are they happy? Are they well, how? I know, no, well, you know what, I'm not, I appreciate the question, and it's one that I ask myself all the time, so it's not a bad question in the least, and it's one, really, I've been trying to answer for decades. Um, Carl Safina is here. So the question is, are those captive elephants in the zoo happy? Are we doing right by them to keep them in this space in the zoo? And this is something that I, I think and write about all the time. And the fastest way to say this is, at the time that we were there, these two elephants had keepers who had been with them for decades and were their family. And I had no doubt that they had very strong bonds. And they were as happy as as these big creatures can be in this small space. And it was enriched for them. Times have changed since then. Some of their longest term keepers are gone. Uh, they lived for this guy, um, Bill Sampson. And Bill Sampson's not there anymore. We, don't, we fail to appreciate often, elephants have very long term, lifelong relationships in the wild. In captivity, sometimes those are human relationships. Replace them, but if the but if a keeper moves to a new job, or gets ill, or retires, that irrevocably changes the life of that elephant. There was a big movement at the time we were there to expand their area, to provide more space, to provide more elephants. Social groupings are vitally important to them. That hasn't gone through, and it's, a, it's something we need to revisit in a, in a very, very serious way. And that holds true of elephants in captivity all around the country. For my part, instead of just saying zoos are bad, I have to say when I read about all these elephants being slaughtered, I, I have great difficulty with all of it and I think Ruth and Emily are safe tonight. Is that enough? I, I'm not sure of the, and that's something we, we all need to explore. They used to take them out and walk them freely in the park. And I worked at the park for years with the elderly at the bombing house. And you know, one day I'm at my desk and I see a hair of this eye and the floor and I thought, Oh my god, it's the elephant. And they never ran, they just right. walked mm -hmm. along with their train, you know, just lumbered about the whole pack early in the morning. And they don't do that anymore. But That's <laughs> thirty years ago they were doing that. I wish you could all hear that comment, which is that you worked at the zoo and in and, and the olden days before the, um, in, the, in the morning, some zoos still do this, before zoo goers come in, they'll bring the elephants out for some decent exercise to walk all around the zoo, which gets everyone, the tigers, worked up. Not a button with their own tigers, but it's a really interesting thing. And by the way, there's one quick story of, at the Pittsburgh Zoo, one of the most touching stories is they would do that with the elephants. One day, a weird thing happened. It was rainy and uh, slippery, and a zookeeper fell while he was walking with the elephants. At the same moment, one of the baby elephants cried out. It had nothing to do with his fall, but the mother killed the keeper because she heard her baby cry. She sees this man in a funny position, and she crushed him with her skull, which is often the way that they kill people, and is very, very commonly reported with elephants. The minute she did it, she appeared to regret it. She tried to stand him. She knew him, and she tried to stand him back up on his feet. They're complicated, interesting, fascinating animals. Yes. Uh, a little bit of uh, further background about Emily and so forth. Uh, the park that they're in was originally designed by Frank Law Olmsted. Why, yes. They designed two parks um, in the area. Now, their office, right to the vet, they were in a travel, they were separate traveling yeah. zoo. And in one case, the zoo cage or whatever it is, lost its wheel, and there's a bandit on the side of the road. The beverage gets a call. You've got some space down there. Can you take this out? 
Well, Macbeth didn't know anything about elephants other than what's in the ocean, the whales, right? So we got, the, the city got a, uh, this first elephant, I can't remember which one. Emily was first. Emily first, and then the other one came, same situation, different traveling circus. And this is kind of a very unique hospitality Macbeth has for seafarers and whatever they get lost and take them in. And we, I worked for the city at the time and the first project I had was finish up this uh, work at Puttenwood Zoo. Well, I found out that the money was not for keeping animals away from people, it was to keep people away from the animals. So it was all reverse. So everything I had to do, even though it was for the animals, I had to make it look like it was for the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sir, do you have a, uh, do you have a question for Vicky? Well, what I'm saying is, now that you know a little bit about, you probably already knew that. Well, and in fact, the second Ruthie didn't come from a. She was a, a private dealer owned Ruthie, the second elephant. He was in trouble with the law. He took a trailer with Ruthie in it, and he abandoned it in the in a garbage dump in the north shore of Massachusetts and was discovered by a guy walking along and, uh, and she was known at the time as a striker, a very dangerous elephant and Bill Sampson was the guy who turned her into what we call a lap elephant today. I wish you were hearing this part. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. It's a wonderful book. Thank but, you. Um, so all those wonderful stories, like the rice, when he you know, had to remember the That's rice, right. and all of that, all of those you found in the letter, in his documentation. He, uh, so, uh, yes, I should back up, because J. H. Williams himself wrote several books, several memoirs, okay. and his wife wrote a memoir okay. also. Okay, so that I didn't know. And okay. his first two memoirs were filled with really terrific information. As his other books came along, I think he was encouraged by his editors to maybe make up some, embellish some of the stories, but the okay, first two were. Yes. I was going over the mountains embellished, or? Yeah, the no, I'd not embellish, and that okay. remains a remarkable. And William Slim, one of the greatest generals of World War II, um, he, wrote, he wrote a lot about the, an escape over the mountains with the elephants in World War II. Well, which, which brings us to an interesting point, Vicki, because you're not only writing history, you're writing field science, history, um, you, you've got many, many layers that you must be absolutely dead accurate on. Yes. It's a quite a, it's quite an undertaking to actually do this because, you know, any given point is very fact-based. Yes. I, I write novels that I try to put a little fact, you know, it's scientifically fact-based. You're writing nonfiction that's fact-based, but on several levels, science, history. Um, do you ever just get overwhelmed with the amount of information that you have to put into a book like this? I mean, this is a lot of information that has to be told in an entertaining way. This is an entertainment product, and I can vouch for that. It is very, very entertaining. But you must, you know, I can, I know that you're addicted to, to detail, too, and yes. uncovering it is sleuthing. So I, I can tell, I know that you feel the same way. Uncovering it is just um, an adventure, and getting everything just right is so perfect. I had it in my, the book before this, The Lady and the Panda, she was, um, a chain smoker, and I wanted to know what brand of cigarettes she smoked. <laughs> and I had magnifying glasses to pictures of her with the cigarette. There's only one time in the whole story where I knew she was smoking Chesterfields in Hong Kong. And so that's the only place in the book where I say Chesterfield, because um, I just want to be, you, we would lose everyone if you get one detail wrong. I, I know how it is to lose sleep over just worried about <laughs> one little fact and if you got it right or wrong. Any other questions in the audience about this book? I, I actually have a question that I think is in three parts. Can you speak to any research that's being done now about further elephant communication in any organized fashion? Also, um, any way that we can help with this effort to address the situation of elephants and other animals in zoo environments? And then can you tell a few more stories <laughs> about their communication and their behavior? Um, Thank you so much. So the first question is, how much is, th is work being done to, um, about their uh, infrasound that they use? And what's fascinating to me, Katie Payne out of Cornell, I, she's not actively there now, but they have the Elephant Listening Project. 
and they actually have worked on something like an elephant dictionary, and it's not obviously word for word, but there are great, great deep studies being done into elephant communication uh, and um, the way that they communicate with one another and the calls and what they mean and certainly their awareness of death and the way that they uh, behave around that. The second part was what people can do. There are so many wonderful elephant groups, whether in the wild or close to home. I struggle with the issues of elephants in captivity. So I, my, I would say please everyone educate yourself because I, I shift back and forth about what I think as I learn things. One thing I know, my great friends in the zoo world uh, who work with elephants love them dearly. They've given, they're not making any money on it and they, they've given over their lives to these inc incredible creatures. Um, it's a complicated, complicated puzzle, particularly as we're losing wild. I wrote a book about zoos in 1996. At that time I remember writing that there isn't, you know, we're having less and less wild for animals to exist in. That's so much more true today than it was then in, in a devastating way. So Daphne Sheldrick's Elephant Orphanage in Kenya is one of my favorites. She does remarkable work there and they're saving elephants. Um, the Cornell Project, um, World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, there are many, many great uh, elephant groups that work very hard to, to save these animals. We're losing 96 elephants a day. Oh. Uh, it, it's, it's beyond imagination, like you can't even figure out in your own mind to imagine how that's happening. Uh, Burma, Myanmar has remained fairly safe because the elephants have continued to work. The females don't have tusks. There isn't as much ivory as we say, which of course is Carl Safina was here. Ivory removes us from what they are, they're elephant teeth. Um, and so um, figuring out the future for elephants is a tough one. And I don't remember your third question. I can't tell any more stories. I think we're out of time. No, no, we, get, we have one more. more. Oh, we do? Okay, great. All right. All right. The, one of my very favorite stories from this would be um, one elephant who is coming to, J.H. Williams established an elephant school in Burma that exists to this day. And they would train the elephants when they turned five years old. They would come into a training camp with their mothers. One of the elephants arrived at camp. His mother, his rider had been, the rider of the mother, um, Fire Opal, had been cutting the vegetation in front of her as they were making their way through the jungle. And he sliced open a kind of plant that can make you go blind if you touch the fluid that's inside of them. Oh, wow. So Fire Opal lost her vision on the way to uh, elephant school. And J.H. Williams, who loved elephants, thought, what am I gonna do with a working elephant can't see. How am I going to deal with this? Does she have to be retired? We'll have to hand feed her for the rest of her life. And as he was considering what to do with her, he noticed that five-year-old, and at the age of five, they're kind of bratty, especially on the first day of school. They want to leave their mothers alone and play. But here was this five-year-old who backed himself up to his mother, and she put her trunk on his back. And in a very practiced way, just from coming there, she led, he led his mother uh, to where she needed to go. And he had a revelation that this young elephant would be the answer to his question, and that he made sure they would never be separated. And what I love too is that they wouldn't name the elephants until they were five years old and knew their character, and so his name became Little Guide Man. That is a perfect story for summing up how beautiful this book is. It really touches your heart, and I can't tell you how much I think you will enjoy Elephant Company. Thanks very much, Vicki, for you, this. Thank you, Kitty. I want to tell everyone that Kitty will be signing her books with me, too. It's a great chance to get some of hers. Please buy their books and go...